All right. So, um, why don't you guys start with just sort of introducing yourselves, uh, what you do, where you work? Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Randy Etheridge. I am a CTO and co-founder of a company here in Atlanta called Split. Um, the elevator pitch is it's a CRM platform for um, restaurants that has a payment application um, on top of it that is an iOS app. The uh, platform itself is uh, mainly uh, Ruby on Rails, and we've got a few other technologies sprinkled in there. My name is Chris Altman. I'm the director of engineering at MCN, and uh, what we do is uh, we bring the data sciences and machine learning into business users. So there's more business users than data scientists. They want to do something with all the data collected, so we develop tools uh, that they can use and use them in a way that they don't have to think about uh, Bayes theory or, or, or machine learning at all, and they just get problem solved. Uh, we, our application is First, a C engine that does a lot of the computation, and then we love SQLite. Uh, SQLite's a big part of our stack, and then Ruby on Rails is uh, our web application, and then some front-end technologies. My name is uh, Jonathan Manuzak. I'm the CTO at CodeGuard. We do website and database backup and protection for everybody from small businesses and bloggers all the way up to big hosting providers. We use a lot of Ruby and Rails, as well as Go, and a variety of other languages and platforms. Cool. So before I move on to the first question, I wanted to just ask you guys in terms of what you're interested in. So I have questions on sort of how to use Ruby, why do you use Ruby, DevOps, development practices, hiring, front end stuff. Um, so quick show of hands, uh, who's kind of interested in the devops -y type stuff? Okay, a few of you. Um, <laughs> development practices, like TDD versus not, Agile, that kind of stuff. A few more, all right. Uh, front end? Okay, and hiring practices. <laughs> All right, so it looks like uh, development practices and hiring got sort of the biggest group of people, so we'll kind of tailor towards that. But we will start out with, um, you guys mentioned you guys use Ruby now, you guys use Rails, but um, in how many apps do you use them? Is it sometimes you use Rails as your main web framework and sometimes not, or is it almost always Rails? So you guys want to just go sequence? Um, so uh, we're a pretty young company, and um, uh, one of the things that I went into uh, when deciding what to build our stack on was something that was going to get the job done and not be um, several different technologies. Um, it makes hiring easier because um, you know you can find the resources necessary to um, uh, work in a specific. Um, uh, technology like Rails or, or Node or something like that, and it'll help um, you, you go going forward with um, uh, transitioning to new products and stuff like that. So uh, our platform is is all Rails based. Uh, the core functionality is uh, built on top of Rails. Uh, front end, um, well, the the mobile front end is, is serviced by an API client that is um, hosted by Rails, and then um, we have a couple of other um, not really core technologies that use um, Node and, and MongoDB and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> we really love Ruby. We have, I was just counting my head, we have six products. Uh, they range from a Rails 2.3 application, uh, which is Mix, uh, to Rails 3 and then Rails 4 now. Uh, we have all those in, in production right now. Uh, I, for me, it's uh, uh, my team, uh, we know Ruby extremely well, we know Rails, we love and hate it at the same time, and Rails is really great at when you want to build something quickly, spike something out, and you can, uh, once you kind of have mastery over it, you know how to quickly move through technical debt. So you can go quickly, if the idea works, you can kind of sit back, refactor a little bit, uh, and it gets the job done in a very um, uh, efficient way. So. Sometimes we kind of build a little toy or a little uh, in-house project that maybe Sinatra or, or something else would be a better tool to use, a better framework, but uh, over and over again we just, you know, generate a Rails application uh, because we just know it so well and it's just, you know, maybe it's a little bit big for a few things, but uh, from just time on keyboard it just makes us work quicker. Yeah, I think we use uh, Rails in a lot of the same way that, that you guys do. 
uh, CodeGuard started what well, we launched publicly in 2011, and we built a uh, Rails 2.3 monolith before monoliths were cool. And uh, that way, that allowed us to really iterate quickly and try to build features as we were looking for product market fit. Um, since then, we've we continue to use the, the Rails 2.3 app, though now it's uh, running Ruby 2 rather than 187. Um, we started refactoring some of the more performant uh, or more the areas that needed to be more performant in languages like Go. Um, though we also use other languages just where they have to be used. For example, we have a PHP plugin, so that has to be, or excuse me, a WordPress plugin, which has to be PHP. Um, we also do Microsoft SQL Server Backup, which probably could be done in Ruby, but we decided to do it in uh, .NET instead because it was much, much easier. So, we're, so good. Yeah. So I, I think uh, the Rails gem is so important, but the thing that I'm most impressed by the Ruby community are the surrounding other gems that exist and just the tooling that exists. And I know that uh, we don't like to add gems to our projects because they introduce a form of risk, but uh, we have at, devise uh, so many other gems, maybe Nokogiri, uh, have been so solid that it just, you don't have to think about the, the, the surrounding pieces of the Rails application because the community, the Ruby community and the Rails community has done such a good job at maintaining the code base and the tools. So with this entire Ruby Rails love fest, let's, let's talk about actually the opposite side of it, right? So you guys have been using it, a couple of you at least, from like Rails 2 and 3 on. What have you seen change over time that you don't like? Like where is the problem space in the Rails community, the Ruby community, that you think other communities do better and you wish you know, the community would change a bit? So I think uh, uh, I don't look back at our Rails 2 application a lot, but, uh, but when I do, I think about the bad ideas that have kind of been erased from Rails 2, and one of them was the, the JavaScript generators, you remember that, where you had, uh, it, I remember it used Scriptaculous as the library to do little animation things, and you had these, this Ruby syntax that would produce JavaScript that sometimes or sometimes did not work, and you had just all these layers of abstraction to try to understand what was really going on, and, and I'm glad that uh, the Rails uh, community has kind of matured away from that because now things are much more, there's less uh, of a path to get down to where things really exist. And I think that from our point of view, it makes it that we understand our applications a lot more intimately so that we can do things more quickly. So uh, I give props to the Rails uh, 2 to 3 to 4 uh, as they kind of got rid of some bad ideas. Um, for me, one of the things that um, has stood out to me as a, a definite step in the right direction, although there's probably a little bit of work still left to uh, be done for uh, by the community, is how you handle asynchronous jobs, kicking those off. Uh, using things like delayed jobs was, was great, but it, it took a while for that to become the de facto and then finally be integrated. Um, you know, what, last year I think it was, or maybe the year before that it actually got integrated as active jobs. So, I think that's a good step in the right direction where the Rails community or the Ruby community in general has seen the, um, you know, some of the reasons why others will go with a node-based application or something a little bit more asynchronous. Um, I, I think community is now trying to, to move in that direction. So I, for one, was happy to see that for some of the uh, back-end stuff that we do. Yeah, and I think uh, to add to that a little bit, the community itself has matured a lot over that time too. I mean, back in the 2.0 days, Ruby may have been out, or excuse me, the, the Rails 2.0 days, Ruby may have been out for a couple of years, but the community was really just starting around it. So now we're at the point where there are these gems like Nokogiri and these other things that really, they almost feel like part of the framework at this point. So it's good that they, you know, Rails is gonna do what DHH wants to do, I guess, but the community is always there adding in these important pieces of infrastructure, and whether it's delayed job or sidekick or rescue, you know, it's nice to have have several good alternatives for common problems um, in the space. Cool. So those are like the really basic questions I have. And before I go into my list of them, does anyone in the audience have a question they'd like to ask? I'll give you five seconds. Uh, yeah, OK. Um, you said MCM's done doing something in machine learning. What do you use for that? Uh, so, we use C for that part of it. Uh, we store all of the data in memory, and we do what we do is clustering. So we build uh, a graph, uh, a graph data structure that represents a lot of transactions in a, in a sparse matrix graph. We cluster, find what are the uh, patterns inside of the data. Then we prune. We've come up with years and years of pruning techniques to get rid of the noise, and then we score those clusters. 
and try to present to the, the business user the most important relationships. That's all done in C because of memory, because of speed. Uh, it, it, we love and hate C at the same time because we miss things like binding that pry inside of C. Uh, but it is what it is. And Ruby has just been uh, really our glue code between the front end and the C uh, executable. A couple more in the audience. We, we had a really smart engineer who uh, would kind of go and do different uh, research projects. And one, he, one was uh, he investigated FFI. So uh, this is not my area of expertise in our code base. So my, my engineers are making fun of me for saying, like, don't talk about FFI because you might botch can, the can details. Can you explain what FFI is? Uh, so the, the uh, acronym is Foreign Function Interface. I believe that's right. And basically, it is a way to control uh, Ruby through C and vice versa. Uh, uh, and what it allows us to do is be able to uh, have things inside of our C engine do the computation, but to be able to interact with it in, with, through Ruby. So a lot of our specs are written in Ruby that are testing the C code. Uh, so that is done explicitly because C is more performant, but we, but we love Ruby and we don't want to abandon it or write a bunch of boilerplate C code all the time. Yeah, I think. I can just jump in there. I mean, what we do in a lot of those cases is we'll just shell out to something that's more efficient. So we will use Ruby as the glue around it to get to a point where we can shell out to whether it's a Go program or even just command line utilities that will do what we need to do and then give us back data that we can then parse in Ruby, which is very powerful. Sam, you have a question? No? All right, I will go down my list and then if any of you has a question, just raise a hand and I will let you ask it. Um, so. I think testing came up a little bit. Uh, so this is one area which I have noticed people do it very differently. There's like the hardcore TDD people, and then there's people that like just don't test anything, and then there's people that like kind of write some crappy tests later that they ignore most of the time. Um, where do you guys fall on that spectrum, and where are you right now, and like where would you like to be, right? Um, I think for us where we're at is somewhere in the middle. Uh, we have not um, sort of bought into uh, TDD as a religion yet, as uh, some like to do, but we do see important, fe important pieces of our um, infrastructure that need to be tested that um, maybe they get updated a lot or they're, they're very, um, um, they're touched a lot whenever we make coding upgrade, uh, updates and, and things like that. So um, we have sort of like a bastardized way of doing that where we highlight some of the crucial pieces of the code that um, um, get updated frequently, and then we write a lot of tests around that so that we can be sure as we uh, push changes or um, you know, we, we are um, maybe upgrading and stuff like that, that those core pieces uh, pass the test, and if not, we can go in and try to investigate like what broke. Uh, it, it came in very beneficial whenever we upgraded to, um, I wanna say Rails uh, 4.2, uh, because one of the gems that we had, um, which is another topic uh, altogether, but one of the gems that we had was not functioning the way it was before, and because we had those tests in place, uh, our spec, you know, spit it out and said, oh, hey, there's an issue here. We were able to go investigate, find there was an issue with that gem, update that gem, and, you know, go to production without any, um, I, I can't imagine how long it would have taken us to get to the bottom of that if those hadn't have been there, so. Um, kind of in the middle. Uh, we test the important stuff. Maybe that's the, the best way to say it. Yeah, I think we, we fall in the middle, too. We try to be pragmatic about it and not dogmatic. Um, one thing I will say about tests, though, is that if they're not running automatically, then you don't really have tests. Like, if you just have tests and they're not running every time you make a change or every time you push to a branch, then you just have a lot of code that gets run when somebody feels like it, I guess. Um, so I think automating those tests is probably more important than actually enforcing the tests are written before the code is written, like in TDD. Um, we, like I said, we try to be pragmatic. We don't, by and large, test everything all the time, but we do use Archive as part of our continuous integration suite. So we're making sure that as we're making changes, as we're adding code, that our coverage isn't going down. Yeah, I think choosing your battles is the right way to think about testing. Uh, 
you know, MC and we deliver numbers on a screen, and so our testing strategy is to uh, test those numbers first before we test the, the web applications, performance, or functionality. So we have a lot of tests written at what we call our engine layer. Uh, all those tests use FFI and Ruby to run our spec. Uh, and we have a very strict policy about writing tests at the engine. But when it comes up to the Rails application, you know, it's not so strict and, uh, and that part of the code base moves so quickly. So uh, we just have to be pragmatic and smart and choose our battles and, uh, and that layer unfortunately doesn't get the same test coverage. Uh, but I would say that at MCM we try to think about testing not as uh, uh, where you should catch your mistakes but to actually, we do a lot of code reviews, we have Slack integration so you could see the commits coming through from all the engineers. So as we bring on new guys, you know, we know that uh, they may or may not have all of the details perfect, so we will watch their commits and we will just kind of say, hey, uh, this will work fine, but if you did it this way, it would have been a little bit more uh, um, idiomatic, a little bit more clean, uh, and so just think like this in this direction. So we try to uh, teach, uh, cultivate, and, and uh, kind of think about quality more than just testing, but the whole process and having a lot of transparency of what commits are getting into the code base. Yeah, I think the craftsmanship kind of mentality is what will help foster good, good testing hygiene. Um, and I think doing code reviews, which maybe we'll talk about later, but code reviews are something that's, uh, that are pretty critical to testing, especially if you have you know, a lot of uh, varying skill levels or varying expertise on the team. I'm curious in terms of the audience, if you're in a Ruby shop right now, how, how many of you say you, your team falls on one of the stricter, more TDD or more testing sides of, of the spectrum? Okay, a couple of you, and then how many of you are like, you would say you're actually way far, you're probably testing less than the average company and, and doing very few tests. Okay, and I guess the rest of you? I would say, I was yeah. just, my experience as a consultancy where you work with 14, 15 apps over the course of the year, it's very vital. Um, in that there, there's a distribution that is like high test, especially for you build, everything's clean. And then you have like the legacy thing that there's some tests that try to box this in and, and put it over in its corner, but it's too expensive to comprehensively test as an extra. So it's, it, it's a messy distribution. Mm -hmm. Either the app is really good or it's... Interesting. All right. So, cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I was going to just, you know, at our company, just, we don't have time to do TDD. We have, we have too much to do. We have, we have too much. <coughs> our scope is too large. We just don't have time to, to mess around. So we, we wet our tests and wet our code. And, you know, we don't do it, you know, with Paris. We just don't do a lot of code reviews. We don't do a lot of things. We just do rich white code all day. So, yeah. Gives us extra. We find that it gives us time. That we buy time. Cool. Um, so. I'm going to keep going in the realm of sort of development practices, and there's so many topics we could touch, but I'll let you guys pick. So pick maybe one thing that you guys do at special, whether it's pair programming or something like that, and that you think is really effective, really important to your de development process. Um. Well, uh, we touched on it just uh, a bit ago, but code reviews are very important, uh, especially in a startup where um, maybe a majority of the code was written by one person or one individual. It's uh, a very, uh, very um, practical way to kind of share that knowledge for people that are joining the team. Maybe they're senior, but no matter how senior you are, you know, every project's a little bit different. There's, there's pieces of it that you're not going to understand right off the bat. And um, one thing that we, we uh, encourage, and I, I think a lot of uh, organizations do this now, and if they don't, I'd be surprised, is making sure that there, there is the, the comprehensive code reviews before anything you know, gets put into one of your, your primary branches. And um, that's beneficial for a lot of reasons. Obviously, it, it keeps your code um, uh, clean. It, it keeps it sort of, um, there's an overarching architecture that gets followed rather than a bunch of people just throwing code into a repo. And um, another big thing that you get out of that is security. Uh, maybe that's something that gets overlooked sometimes, but y you know, there have been a, a few times where I've been doing code reviews and noticed, oh, 
there's an API key in here. Now we've got to go scrub get to get that out of here because it, it shouldn't be there and uh, things like that. So that's one thing that we, we find very, uh, very useful to, to make sure that we're all on the same page and, and, and moving forward with it, um, especially at the speed at which a, a startup moves. Um, another good practice that I think is, um, it, it's more of a, more of a cultural, cultural thing than, uh, I guess, development practice, but uh, before a big launch, we, we try to sit down and talk about things that we're really, really proud of that we achieved, no matter how minute it may be, or no, maybe you optimize some random uh, method that used to take two seconds and now it takes one and a half, something like that. That's an enormous amount of time, but um, <laughs> just optimizing to, you know, things like that. And I think it's really good for others on your team to understand that the little things that they care about, you care about too, because I, I think sometimes that doesn't really uh, flow for you to think, oh, well, you know, I care a lot about this, but I'm probably the only one who cares. And it's, it's good reinforcement to know that it's a big deal to everybody. We, uh, we try to maintain fairly loose processes, but the processes that we do have, we try to automate. So even things that are as simple as the pull request code review, you know, we have a nice Kanban board that shows the, the issues moving through the process. Um, when we have somebody reviewing a pull request or accepting it, like that goes into our HipChat system so we can see that somebody's working on this, somebody has approved it, somebody's left comments. So we try to make it as easy as possible for our team to do the right things without thinking about it. And automating, even though there is a time and expense up front for some of those things, um, does make it easier in the long run to keep people walking down the path that, that they need to be walking down to maintain quality uh, you know, quality product. Um, that and no deploys on Fridays. Yeah, that is a good one actually. Uh, I, I think two things come to mind when you ask a question. Uh, number one is we love to talk. We're a very verbal company. Uh, we require everyone to be in the office to work. Uh, some, you know, you can work from home once in a while, but uh, so much happens when you're just talking. And so uh, we have whiteboards and we play pool together, a bumper pool game together, and we do a lot together. We go drinking sometimes together. And the point is, like, when you really understand how each other think, then you cannot, uh, then you know who's the right person to go and get help from. And, and it really, great things come out of that type of collaboration. Number two, I think uh, what I like and I think is unique to Emcene is that I love asking engineers to do something that they never thought they would do. So what I mean by that is that uh, I strongly believe that you should have some time on keyboard for all pieces of the stack from the Linux operating system all the way up to the JavaScript front end. And why that's important is that each layer kind of has its own unique set of trade-offs. And, and once you understand how data flows from input to output and all the kind of phases as it goes through, you become a better engineer. And I love when I ask a Rails engineer, hey, go work on this Ubuntu uh, you know, upstart job process that you have to go figure out, or go do something in our DevOps cycle, or go do something in JavaScript. You know, they get scared for a second, but once they kind of calm down and realize it's all the same thing when you kind of boil it down, uh, they get excited and they become a little bit, they see the picture, the big picture a little bit more clearly. And I think uh, uh, our engineers, you know, they really like to think of themselves as software engineers rather than Rails engineers because they, kind of, they, they really see it as, you know, data structures and, and, and uh, business logic and not just uh, syntax. Cool. Um, actually, I'll pause real quick. Anyone think of a question? Yes. Um, sure. For us, it's kind of easy because we're, you know, we're we're, we're young, so we're, we've gotten a lot of feedback, uh, especially very recently. Every time we release, we get a lot of feedback. So, the way that a feature or a requirement comes down the pipe, unless it's something administrative or or something to help us with our processes internally, it's usually in the form of um, you know a recommendation or maybe we see some particular usage through our mix panel um, integration that's showing us something, a problem or an opportunity to improve. So um, that gets brought in to someone that is um, acting for whatever the project is, acting as the product owner for that project. And it's up to, we use Asana for tracking. So it's up to them to create that Asana task, put the um, requirements in there in the form of, it could be user stories. We don't have a very strict process along those lines, but basically, um, you know, acceptance criteria for this feature being completed. 
And then from there, depending on what that is, it gets distributed to the person responsible. Um, if it's an engineering thing, then it would typically fall in, um, in, into my bucket. And then I would um, uh, assign that out to either myself or someone else on the team um, that is either has more availability or is better suited to handle whatever that particular feature is. And then um, development will be, uh, will kick off on that. We use Gitflow, so um, you know people will branch off from develop and start um, coding away. And then when they're happy that they've met the um, acceptance criteria, and it could be bits and pieces of that criteria depending on how large it is, um, a pull request is generated with the Asana ticket um, noted inside of the, um, or either the pull request noted inside of Asana or the Asana link noted inside of the pull request, and then um, they will assign approvers to that depending on uh, what project it's um, in regards to. Um, approvers look over it, do a, a code review, and then if, if they're happy that the code looks great um, and, and, and is ready to go, it gets merged into our development branch, which gets um, deployed out to one of our uh, staging servers so that we can test it internally, um, sort of like run it through the ropes, QA and, and stuff like that. And once that is satisfied and you know we get the green light, um, it moves up into ready for production. And uh, after we get enough of those to um, you know, elevate that code base up to prod in a different version, then it'll, it'll go to production. Uh, depending on how big or small that is, it can happen in, in, the mat in a matter of hours or a matter of, you know, weeks. So um, that's really it. Yeah, Do you guys manually test during that process? or is it Yeah, QA is a very manual. Uh, so we have a lot of dependencies on technology, not necessarily in our control, uh, because we have to integrate with the point of cell systems, which they're all from the 1700s. <laughs> and it, it's very tough to automate um, a lot of the, the different edge cases that we can run into on the variety of different point of cells that are out there. So um, it, it is a very manual QA process um, once you know, before anything goes to prod. So we, we usually uh, get a lot of features together and, and kind of put them in a bucket. And then we start uh, QAing from there while doing regression testing as well um, on existing stuff. And once um, uh, everyone who's involved with QA, which can be anywhere between four to eight people, um, uh, unless any bugs come up, uh, it usually gets green lit and then it gets elevated to production. Uh, our process has many of the same similarities, Git flow and a QA phase. Uh, <clears throat> where it starts, though, is that uh, we, I go to a conference room, the CTO, and then our services director who kind of interfaces with the customers all the time, and we have a big war. You know, we, I come in and say, hey, I need six months to pay down this technical debt. I have to do this. And they say, hey, I need these features because they're going to help us close this next round of deals. We need those first. And, and we have to battle it out because, uh, you know, sales always wants the next thing and they always sell the next thing. And uh, we have and we serve a business. So we have to deliver uh, at some pace. But at the same time, we know that if the code base gets too uh, crappy, it's going to fall down at some point. And that's where QA just can't keep up with a crummy code base. Uh, so we, we have our war and uh, half of mine get picked and half of theirs get picked. We write them up at JIRA, we kind of scope out the time, so that might be roughly a three month development phase. Uh, we, we work with a very large companies, so they don't like continuous uh, deployment. They often deploy their, our software behind their firewalls, so there's a process for them to do an upgrade. So our timelines are a little bit uh, longer because of our, the nature of our business and we take advantage of that. Uh, we often do something what we call inside uh, MCN crawl, walk, run. And what that means is that uh, the first idea, you know, the engineer wants to make it perfect. We love perfection. And, uh, but that takes time and that takes energy. So build up enough where we can walk with or crawl with this feature. And if it makes sense, you know, you get some feedback, then you do the walk. And then when you finish it with the run, and that seems to go really well because the idea rarely finishes from what you thought it would be in the beginning. And, uh, and that's a good, that's, it's also a good mentality because you have a lot more people involved, so you don't go down a lot of rabbit holes, which just kind of, you get lost in. Uh, and then we do a bunch of in-house, uh, we use our products in-house. We have a team of consultants. They are always working with our customers. They'll use our product and they'll break it in certain ways that we just open up uh, Jira issues and fix them as fast as possible. Uh, 
And we, uh, we, often, we also uh, sell our products through Cisco. They white label two of our products, and that is that adds a lot of paperwork to our development process and a lot of uh, security uh, testing and, and verification. And uh, so we deploy our products, we make our versions available, and then we go through you know, a, a company of 20 people with a comp and working together with a company of 80,000. It is fascinating to see the differences in our development process, and we have to kind of flow into theirs at times. Yeah, so it sounds like our overlap is, is pretty high here, especially with the uh, the, the particular Git processes and features. We use GitHub for everything. I know there's you know a lot of uh, diversity in the tools that are available, but we've focused on GitHub. So we use GitHub issues with one tiny layer called Hueboard over top of that for making it a Kanban style board. Um, other, otherwise, uh, one, one way that what we do might be interesting is because we work with a lot of infrastructure for our backups, we do somewhere in the neighborhood of like 425,000 backups every day. Um, we need a lot of servers to do that for a pretty short period of time. So within Amazon, we're all, all often scaling up to 100, 150, 200 servers. Um, we use infrastructure automation that we've built internally to manage all of that. But one thing that uh, that gets us as far as the deploys go is if we have a feature that is going to affect the backup process or the backup data, we don't have to deploy it to everybody at once. We can do something like Facebook calls the, the blue-green deploys, where we can deploy just a small subset of servers running this new code um, test it out, see how it goes. We can do this for hours, days, or weeks. Make sure everything's working well before we roll it out to the entire cluster. Cool. I know there's one more audience question. I guess, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Sarah. I'll let her go, because you already asked a question, I think. Yeah. Um, I guess, um, Chris, you mentioned whiteboarding, and I've been reading a lot of technical articles and books, and they mentioned how in a technical interview, you often have to do whiteboarding, but then there's this reassurance that won't really ever happen again, because that's only so, I don't know, this might be a naive question, but you mentioned whiteboarding, so I was wondering, what did you mean by that? I thought it was something that doesn't really happen often. Uh, it, it happens for hours every day at MCN. Uh, so, in our interview process, we, uh, we actually ask the candidate to go to the whiteboard, and we say, okay, imagine that this is our first day working for you. So go to the whiteboard, explain to me what our first day on the job is, what our product is, you know, what, we, what we're gonna work on together. And the point of that is uh, uh, not for them to teach me you know, the product that they came from, biggest, you know, half the time we tell them, you can make it up, we don't care. I just wanna see that you're comfortable communicating and that uh, it's very simple little keys of, when you, know, when you write on the whiteboard, some, that it's legible, <laughs> you know, that it's the right size, that, you know, you when you communicate a system or an idea that you can you don't you understand what is the right layer of abstraction to, to talk about at the right time, uh, and uh, and we do that because uh, communicating is so important inside of MCN because what we do is very complicated. We don't have a lot of direct competitors that we can go and imitate, uh, and then what we find out is that if we kind of thrash through an idea together. Before we even get to the keyboard, we often write less code because the ideas can kind of get you know uh, parsed out before we actually get to the, the code writing part. So I would say that our engineers, we, we use the whiteboard. I use it every day. Some of the other guys maybe once or twice a week. Uh, we do something where we have Tuesday morning uh, breakfast and learns. So each engineer is asked to go and present something once a month to the rest of the team. and. Uh, those things can be very uh, esoteric or they can be very general. Uh, uh, and they often require a whiteboard because sometimes we do it with a, a, a PowerPoint or, or you know, a keynote. But those, I think in the long, like just seeing a bunch of them, those are less interesting because they're kind of more formalized. And when the engineer, we're just talking together on the whiteboard, it becomes much more fluid, it becomes more of a discussion and a collaboration and not so much of a presentation. And if I may offer on that one, I think the confusion may lie in, in what, how they were using the term whiteboarding. Uh, in the technical interview, when you hear that term, people are usually talking about uh, the, the interviewer will ask you to go to the whiteboard and code, you know, pseudocode something like Fibonacci sequence or something like that. That doesn't happen very often in the workplace. That's something that the interviewer will do just to kind of um, 
you know, see your style of thinking through a problem and, and how you take that problem and, and put code on it, whereas um, the, the whiteboarding um, the, that Chris is referring to is very much used because that's how you take things that are in your head and, and share it with others, you know, through, you know, uh, communication, whether it's pictures or flow diagrams or anything like that. But you, you will rarely go up and, like, code a function unless you're really trying to prove a point. Yeah, I think the, the whiteboard interviews, I think they are very much a communication test. Um, some people apply them different ways, so you see everything from the, you know, algorithm, like explain this complex al algorithm to uh, Fibonacci sequence to write a for loop in this language that you don't really know. Um, but I think internally, they are very much just a communication tool like everything else. Like we use Google Docs, we use Google Sheets, we use you know, chat clients, it's just another tool that we can use to, to help each other understand what's inside of our head and uh, get it out into the open so we can talk about it and talk through it. So we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, I know I saw one hand up, anyone else? We were gonna talk about DevOps. We were gonna talk about DevOps and we were, so I can ask a DevOps question if you wanna do that. <laughs> Or why don't you go ahead? You have maybe a better question. It, it, it's a short question. I just was wondering if you guys could talk about So two of you mentioned manual QA, you didn't mention manual QA. Just how important is that to your process? Um, again, from our perspective, it's very important because of the um, unreliable technologies we touch. Um, it, it's very much any little change that we make in the way that we process certain things could have uh, you know, the butterfly effect on those in technologies, and unfortunately, um, it's, it's just the nature of how these operate and how their APIs, their rudimentary APIs are, is sometimes it's written in stone. So if we make a mistake, um, you know, for instance, let's say that um, we, we do some math wrong or we do something uh, that, that makes a, uh, a check go to zero. Once we tell the, that point of sales that check is zero, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, it's going to close that check and there's nothing you can do to get it back because that's how their API was written. So for us, we have to do a lot of manual QA along with automated uh, testing of our code to be 100% positive that when we go to prod, we're not going to you know, wind up with a lot of unpaid tickets for, for people in you know, hundreds of, of restaurants. I love Hey QA. I mean, they, they save my butt a lot of times, but a lot of times they just create tons of extra work. Uh, um, I think what is special about our QA is it's more than just testing. Uh, they, they work closely with customers because they often do support issues also. They do support and QA and a little bit of documentation. So they're a good job at kind of thinking like the customer. And when you're so close to the product, when you're an engineer and, you know, and the, the terminal is so comfortable to you, sometimes you get lost. You can get you can overlook something that would be so easy for a customer to appreciate. And they often come and uh, work with us to say, you know, think of it this way. This is confusing. You know, this isn't necessarily wrong or a defect, but it's confusing and you should reevaluate this. So our QA is both, uh, 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 you know, correct or not, but it also is a gut check of does this make sense to someone outside of the MC and engineering team. And for example, you know, one thing that I, I really hate is rounding numbers because you know rounding 0.9999 you round it goes to 100 percent but humans think of 100 percent as an absolute and 0.999 is not and you know we fight with that i lost that battle but i fought with that a long time in qa <laughs> but they made the and they were right you know nine 99.99 is not 100 percent so we had the right custom <laughs> rounding functions that would show the precision out to that value to make it work and, and those are just examples of things that uh you know, we're working so quickly, we kind of have a different way of looking at the world and software, and they kind of are a good, you know, balance to, to what we do. Yeah, we do have a QA process. We have a staging system that everything goes through before it goes out to production. Depending on the, the size and scope of the, the feature or the bug or whatever, um, that'll, that will change how QA is applied. Uh, often QA is wrapped into our pull request process where the reviewer will perform the QA as stated by, or as uh, 
you know, depending on what is spe uh, specified in the initial feature request or in the initial issue. Um, if it's a larger project, then we'll pull in other people from the team to, to do manual QA as well. We rely very heavily on the automated tests. We have some uh, automated front end tests as well to make sure that the user experience continues to behave the way we expect in addition to like functional unit tests. Um, but, you know, it kind of depends on the size and scope of the actual issue. Cool. All right, so that's about time. Uh, we didn't get to talk about DevOps much, or I want to ask some of Ryan questions as well. Um, I will finish with one very final question. So what is one gem that you have found really useful that most people don't know about, but you just think is amazing? I don't want to go first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, so device, you know. I love device because I never think about it. And <laughs> it is paramount to what we do. I mean, it is user authentication. and. Uh, Without it, you know, writing our own user authentication system would be a mountain of bugs and security issues that would be uh, a waste of our time, quite frankly, and uh, is really complicated to do. And, and you know, Devise, the wiki of Devise is so thorough. Uh, we've connected it to LDAP, it's Active Directory. We have API keys going through it. Uh, it has served us and saved us so much time, and I feel like, you know, it's the second thing you do after you generate a Rails application is to install device and get that configured. Um, the one that I think that I've used and I'm surprised that everyone who's using AWS isn't using um, is, I think it's, forgive me if I get it wrong, but I want to say it's ELBS um, uh, uh, dash deploy. It's a gem. It's uh, one guy wrote it. There's not very contributors. I'm actually one of those contributors now because I needed a, something that wasn't in it when I first started using it. But uh, what it does is it helps automate the process of being able to deploy your code from Capistrana into an auto scaling group for AWS. Um, in the past, that was a, a, a huge pain because uh, if you're not familiar, you have to have these different, um, uh, or your, the, the way an auto scale group works is it grabs an image that you have a reference to somewhere in your cons or in, inside your AWS environment, and it basically spins up a machine based on that image. Well, when you deploy new code to um, production, that image is no longer valid and you have to uh, recreate that image and then you have to spin down any other um, uh, things that were using it and you, by the way, have to make that image. You don't have to, but the most common way to make that image is uh, using, um, you basically deploy it to one server, grab the image of that one and then replace it in the auto scaling group. And uh, this gem, it does it all. It, it deploys to any that are currently running inside that scaling group, and then it'll take the first one in that group and create an image from it, and you don't have to do anything, and it was pretty awesome. I think the one that I would say is called Rails LTS. As somebody that runs a legacy Rails 2.3 app, Rails LTS will actually continue to provide um, community submitted as well as paid support for Rails 2.3 security patches, things like that. I'll mention mine. I love this gem called the Overcommit, which automates like running. Well, you guys use MCN too. It automates running like linters and things on every commit and running your tests on every push. So it keeps me from basically my own little mini CI server on my machine. Um, anyways, cool. Thank you so much for joining us. You guys give them a round of applause. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at RIET.